Howdy everybody, Steve here, KM9G, and today we're going to turn this into this. This is the Super Pixie Kit. Not just a pixie, but a Super Pixie. Stick around and I'll show you how it's done. And we're going to talk about a little radio that fits in this box. This is probably one of the more prevalent kits. It's almost, this is like power poles in terms of ham radio stuff. It is almost a rite of passage that if you're going to be a kit builder, you have to build at least one of these. And then after you're done building it, you have to level up again and become a uh, kit basher and start making this thing do a whole bunch of other things that it wasn't originally designed for. This is the Super Pixie. And the one that I have picked up here is for the 7023 or the 7050. And the reason why is because it comes with multiple crystals. So with the multiple crystals, what you're gonna be able to do is switch between that frequency or that one, between 023 or 050 by popping out the crystal and popping a new one in. 023 is in the extra portion, 050 is in the general portion, but you can build this kit and transmit into a dummy load and uh, just have a good fun experience building the kit. This one we got off of Amazon. There is a link in the description down below where to get it. And by the end of the video series, maybe you'll decide that you want one. Maybe you'll decide that it's hot garbage. I don't know, I haven't built it yet. The instructions are pretty good. Lots of pictures, I like that. Power on, do not distinguish between positive electrode and negative electrode, internal rectification. What they're saying here, if I understand their, their language correct, is you can plug it in or reverse the polarity and either one is gonna be fine. It looks like it will work with either kind of key, an auto key or a manual key, so an iambic key or a straight key. We'll have to test that out too. Then they give you some information on antennas. The antenna is the key of the shortwave station, which is absolutely true. And they want you to have a 50 ohm antenna with an SWR of less than 1.5 to one. And this will work off of 12 volts, which is nice. So it'll work with everything else that's in my shack. List of components and a circuit diagram, but there really isn't anything that tells you how to install it. So let's take a look at what comes in the box. Cause there's not really like a, a step one, step two. There just is a suggested order. So, Let's get after the parts in the box. All right, so there's a bunch of resistors there and they are different values. And they're, they're smaller than normal resistors. There's the crystals that we talked about. We've got a chip, a socket, a speaker, rectifier, et cetera, et cetera. BNC connector, a knob, a jack, another knob, another jack and a power jack. And then some standoffs and some feet to make the case, some capacitors, a couple of different uh, values of capacitors in there. Let's take a look at this part here and see if this reveals any mysteries. The acrylic case, which is a nice addition. You don't need the case, but it is nice that it has the case. Okay, so top and bottom and four sides. Perfect, that's nice. That's actually a nice little feature there. So we'll put the case and we'll put the legs off on the side. Jacks are pretty self-explanatory. What I'm gonna have some fun with are these guys here. That big gray one looks like it's your dummy load. It comes with its own dummy load, nice. So I'm gonna get some paper, I'm gonna get this all sorted out. Okay, so some of these things are easier to read than others. And what I like to do is inventory all of my parts. If you've seen me build stuff on stream before or on video before, then you know I like to inventory parts because it just makes my life a little bit easier. So let's see what do we have here. 103, 103, 103, 104, 101, 473, 103, 104, 101. And then these ones I couldn't hardly read. Let's get out a magnifying glass. 471 and 471. And then I tape them down in case I don't get this project finished all at once. I can come back and the parts are still sorted just the way I left them. Where this method really helps me out is with these resistors because I have trouble with the color codes. So my trick for that is to get my multimeter and set it into resistance mode directly. 460, 48, 49K, 1K, also 1K. See, that looks like a totally different set of colors to me. 10, 88K, and I'm just going with the numbers that are written right here and then we'll check against the parts list and it'll give us a different story, but we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. 10K, 30K. And I am not a fan of these two because these two look pretty different to me. That's 1K and that's 10K. See, there we go. Measure twice, cut once. I can see what I did with that 1K and 10K. I just uh, didn't look at the decimal point. 
Now, if I did this right, they're not going anywhere. They didn't fall off. All right, so we got those out of the way. A lot of these other parts are fairly self-explanatory, but we'll see what we can do with these anyway. So we've got pin headers, chip sockets, fairly straightforward. That goes with the chip, a shunt. These green ones are interesting. All right, some more capacitors. We'll get those sorted out. An LED and transistors. We'll get those sorted out. A diode, not a diode. So this is 100 microfarad, 16 volt. And then these three look to be the same. 25 volt, 10 microfarad, 25 volt, 10 microfarad. And the, the shrink wrap on that almost went off the screen. All right, so we're back to diodes. Diodes have tiny writing on them. I see this 1N4001 diode a lot in and projects are these two transistors the same? S9018, S8050. So they're actually two different transistors. Okay, and then those three green ones are different. Yep, so we got a 22, a one, and a 100. And I don't have any easy way of measuring those. So let's see what it says about the inductor. It says number nine, inductance. <laughs> That's all you get. We'll, we'll come back to those. This should be the bridge rectifier, 2W10. And this one here, is tiny and I don't think I'm going to be able to read anything on it but here's the beauty of what we're doing we don't have to be able to read anything because there's only two diodes in the kit we already identified the other diode so this must be the one that isn't identified yet which makes it a 1N4148 and then I do believe that this is a let me load for us yeah 51 ohm 1 watt resistor is what this one here should be so let's see how that measures out. 50.4, close enough. So we are still stuck on these inductors to the internet. Okay, so that was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> fun. Uh, this one actually turned out to be two micro Henry's and then this one turned out to be 100 micro Henry's because the color codes on here are actually, actually brown, black, brown with a silver tolerance. And I was trying to figure out that they were red, black, red with a silver tolerance, or if they were white, red, black with a red tolerance, or if they were gray or whatever. I do not like color codes. I know there's a whole lot of different ways to do it, but I didn't know I was colorblind until I started doing solder projects. Either way, there are solutions for these kinds of things. I knew that the last value, the last remaining value out of my inductance chart here was 100 microhenries. So I just started fiddling around with the color calculator that I showed you on screen until I was able to find the values that made sense and then work them backwards to color because that could have been red or that could have been brown. Let's see if we can get that up on the camera for you. So the short answer to that is don't stress out. There's a way to figure it out. I just showed you the way to figure it out and we can move forward with it. So you're not the only one, I'm not the only one that suffers from this problem. I actually learned this trick from another YouTuber uh, who's also another ham, who is also another kit builder. So I was able to level up my game by doing that. So we're all good to go. We've got all of our parts that need sorting sorted and we are ready to start working on the project. Okay, so now that we have all of these parts sorted out and identified, let's make sure that we actually have every part that we're supposed to have. So I'm supposed to have one 10 ohm resistor. Check, check. One 470K ohm resistor, 470K? 470 ohm resistor. Resistors have a tolerance band on them, plus or minus X percentage, whatever. 460 is close enough to 470 that I am going to believe that it is that one, and I'm going to check that off. What we did was we got all of the parts identified, all of the parts sorted, ready to roll, and so we can get started on building. Soldering iron is up to temperature. I have my solder right here. I am in the US. I pronounce it solder. That's the way we do things over here. My trick for building things like this, I don't use a circuit board holder or anything. My trick for building things like this is to start with the lowest profile pieces, the pieces that are going to sit as close to the surface of the board as possible. The reason for doing that is if I were to take something like this big old BNC jack and install it first, it's going to do this really weird thing when I go to install the next part called being in the way. And those of you with siblings know exactly what being in the way is all about. So now I've got that BNC jack mounted and soldered all in place as an example. And when I set it down to do the soldering on the next part, the board moves all over the place. So that's why we wanna start with the smallest pieces first. I am gonna start with the 1N4148 because that is the smallest one. 
diodes are kind of temperature sensitive. So I want to make sure that I get this in and get it out as quick as possible. I'm going to look at my guide here. 4148 is D3. Let's find D3 on the board. All right, so there is D3 and diodes have a little ring wrapped around them. So this is made of glass, it's mostly orange, and there's a black band. And you want that band to line up with the band that is on the silk screen when you build it. Diodes only allow electricity to flow through in one direction, and so if you put it on the wrong way, it's not protecting the thing you want it to protect, and that would be bad. Okay, this is bent really tight, so I'm gonna have to re-bend this from the way the factory bent it. And because of the design of this kit, everything is really tight really close by. So I'm actually going to pull this down even closer to the circuit board by grabbing a mechanical advantage device. And now we've got that nice and flush looking all professional on the board. And I've got the legs splayed out on the back and that's going to hold the part in place when I do my solder. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get some solder on my soldering iron to freshen up the tip, clean it off, and then put a little bit of solder on here to make a better heat transfer with the board. I'm gonna get in nice and quick and apply some heat to it. You can check your work musically because it'll make a nice sound if it's actually fully soldered in properly. I run my soldering iron at 640 degrees Fahrenheit and you just wanna get in, get it soldered and get it out. That is your first part on. I'm gonna run through the rest of the parts and see what we can come up with. Resistors do not have an orientation, so you can put them in any direction you want. I like to line them up so that the color, color bands line up, just to be a little more professional. And in this case, they go in all different directions. All right, I'm gonna get through the rest of these resistors and I will be right back. For doing soldering work, you're gonna want a good quality soldering iron and a good quality set of side cutters, flush cutters. These flush cutters are very sharp. They're designed for doing this kind of work and don't take kindly to doing anything more industrial than this kind of work. And you will wear these out. So I have a couple of pairs of these. There will be links in the description for the side cutters, the diagonal, the flush cutters, for the soldering iron and for the solder. I am using leaded solder. Leaded solder flows better for me. And I'd rather get the project done than fuss about the tiny little bit of fumes. I run a fume extractor and it takes all of the fumes away from me and I don't have to worry about it. All right, we've got all of the resistors done and that leaves us with the next lowest thing is gonna be the inductors. Okay, so nothing scary about putting the inductors on. That's what they look like. L1, L2, L3, all set. I guess we're into capacitor land now. Let's put on these 104s. All right, so there's nothing fancy about capacitors uh, of this kind here, this yellow kind, this blue kind. These are different, we'll get to those in a minute. These don't have an orientation that you need to put them in, you just kind of put them in. And what I like to do again is I like to make sure that the numbers are on the same side. So when I pick the board up, if I look at it, I can see all of the capacitor numbers. It's just being neat. It doesn't really provide any other purpose other than that. And in this set here, you saw that I put them both in first on the top side, spread the legs, flipped it over and did the soldering. There's no reason why you can't put every single one of these in. Batch it up however makes you comfortable. Okay, so there is, turn it right side up. There's all of the capacitors that we needed to put in place. Let's do the triodes. We're gonna do the 8050 first, which goes into Q2. And for triodes, for transistors, let's see if I can find the footprint on the board. This white silk screen outline is called the footprint. So there's Q1 and there's Q2. Triodes, transistors have a flat side on them and then a rounded side on them. And on the silk screen, you'll see a flat side and a not flat side. And that should be a big light bulb going off in your head as to why those are the way they are. And so what I do with these is I just kind of walk them from one side to the other until they fit in. But you can pre-bend these 
I just do it like that. And then while I'm at it, let me do the other one, which is the 9018. And these part numbers mean something. So if you go online and you look up 9018 transistor and the word data sheet, you'll be able to find out what these different things here do. Okay, and then I try and do the same thing with the transistors that I do with the diodes. They're relatively heat sensitive, so I try to keep a relative amount of heat out of them. That takes care of the triode and the other triode. And that leaves us with the polarized parts. So let's see what we can do with polarized parts. We have an LED and we have four polarized capacitors. Polarized means that they have to go in in one very specific orientation. An LED, the D standing for diode, means it can only pass electricity in one direction. And so we want to make sure that we're passing it in the right direction. That would be smart. So where is D4? I literally don't see that. I'm down by the speaker. So I cheated and looked for the LED on the board, on the picture of the board, kind of like looking at the puzzle, the picture on the box of the puzzle. It is near the speaker. And it's right there and it was staring at me the whole time. So these have a circle with a flat edge on them and if you look real closely, these have a circle with a flat edge on it also. This one's a little hard to see, but the flat edge is on the shorter leg. So we want to put the longer leg on the positive hole and the shorter leg on the negative hole. And there we go with that. And you'll see that same thing on the silk screen on the circuit board. You'll see a positive symbol for the positive leg, the long leg, and you'll see the circle with the flat edge and the flat edge is close to the short leg, the negative side. So line it up. And then we have these three 25 volt, 10 microfarad. These are the same kind of deal. It should be identified with a negative symbol on the short leg and the long leg is the positive. And if we look at the board, okay, so you can tell by the way that the through holes are outlined that one of them is connected to the ground plane and one of them is not. The one that is connected to the ground plane is the negative one and the negative one is the short leg. So let's put the short legs on the white holes. And let's take a look at the directions and see what the directions say, if I was right or not. There we are, directions. You see the negative side of the capacitor and the white side of the silk screen. So I was correct. So lots of different ways to arrive at the same answer. All right, we're getting pretty far down our list of parts. We've done all of our resistors. We've done our electrolytic capacitors. We've done almost every transistor except for the bridge rectifier. Let's get that done. And where was that? The bridge rectifier is right here on the board and it's got a plus and minus indicator. So there should be some kind of plus and minus indicator. If you look very closely at what's written on the device, you'll see that the plus sign goes to the long leg. So we want to put that in so that the plus side lines up with the hole with the plus sign on it on the board. And another way that you will see how this works out is your plus hole or your pin one or the hole of interest is usually square while the rest of them are round. And this negative hole has the same thing where you can see that this one has a circle of green around it because it's not connected to the ground plane. And this one has a couple of lines leading off of it to connect it to the ground plane, which would make it negative. Okay, so now we've got all of those parts taken care of. So that's the entire left side. Let's come over here. We have the IC left, the LM386. All right, ICs, integrated circuits. This one has a socket that we're gonna put it into. There's a little notch on the socket. And if you look at the silk screen, you will see that there is a notch on the silk screen. This is gonna be really difficult to understand and follow, but we wanna line the notches up with the notches. So I'm gonna straighten these pins out a little bit. And there are a lot of different ways to do this. This board is pretty tight. Uh, what some people will do is put a piece of masking tape over top of that, put a piece of cellophane tape over top of that. They make this stuff called glue tack. What I do is I tack down one corner
like so. And then I check my work to see if it's good or not. And it is. But if it's not good, what you can do is you can apply some pressure with your finger and reflow that solder. And then you'll hear it snap into place. And then I just go about putting more solder down. Now that it's all set. Some people will do two corners. I do one. Depends on how big the socket is, I guess. And then once you've got some other ones in, you come back and you redo that first pin that you put in place. And it's the same thing with the chip. There's a little hole that indicates P1. There's a little notch that indicates P1. So you line up the notches with the notches with the notches. Make sure all of your pins are lined up properly with the socket. There's not one that's going over or under. And then push it into place. Okay, now we have crystals. And this is a two crystal kit. So what I want to do is I want to find the crystal that I'm, going, that I'm going to get the most enjoyment out of. And even though I am an extra, I'm going to get the most enjoyment out of 7050 because that's where there's going to be more hams playing along. So there's 7023 and there is 7050. And these have the same kind of thing. There's kind of an oval footprint on there and it's labeled Y1. So we're going to get that put into place. And if you want to get really fancy, you can use some DuPont connectors or um, a chip socket or, or something and make yourself a socket for this. So you can switch these sockets in and out, switch these sockets, switch these crystals in and out between the two different varieties, or there is a VFO kit so that you can actually, ooh, that one went across the room so that you can actually tune this thing between multiple frequencies. So there's the 7050 crystal in place. That leaves the 7023 crystal in reserve. Mark that off. And then now we get into jacks. So I'm gonna put the audio jacks in next because they're the ones that are the smallest footprint, the closest to the board. And these can only go in one way. So we'll put that in there. I might as well do both of them at the same time. These are holding themselves in nicely, but I'm gonna do the same trick where I just put in one pin and then I check to make sure that they're flat like I want them and they are. And there's some extra holes right there that don't have anything connected to them. So don't worry about them. Next up is the DC jack. And then the buzzer, the speaker. <laughs> it's got a little magnet in it, it's picking up all my solder legs. And then what did we learn about everything else? The short leg is the negative one. So we'll put that in long leg on the long leg side. And then I'm gonna do the same trick with this to make sure that it's flush with the board. Pin and jumper cap. So that's interesting. It's a very long set of pins. And I'm guessing they gave you a long set of pins because of the case that they are using with it. So we'll put the jumper cap back and we'll look for J5 it is. J5 it is. That's going to hold itself in place. That's very nice. You see how we're starting to lay lay in interesting angles now. All right, I'm happy with that. Let's keep on rolling. And we have a BNC and we have a variable resistor. So the BNC is gonna have the lower profile, so we're gonna do the BNC next. And these are bent up just enough that it's holding itself in place. These larger pins are connected to the ground plane. The larger pins themselves are larger and the ground plane is almost the entire backside of the circuit board. So you're gonna to wanna to get some extra heat in there. It's gonna take it a little bit longer to flow than normal. So don't panic, take your time. 
variable resistor, 47K. That would be the only part left to put on. And we've got a couple of different places that this thing can go. So it looks like there's some choices with this kit that you can get different parts for different things. And there's a couple of different footprints here, but it only fits into one properly. So there you go, that's the one we're gonna use. Pin was just a little bent, so I fixed it up. All right, so just a little bit of added pressure, a little bit of extra difficulty to get that in. Take your time, be patient. And it will go in just fine. All right, and those look like they're a little bit too strong for me to use my valuable cutters on. So I will not use my valuable cutters on them. Let's take a look at our parts list here. Cross off our last part, double check. PCB1 is already done, we can double check that. I'm not gonna do the dummy load because I have a regular dummy load I can use. And the acrylic case is next. There we go, folks. Let's do the case. All right, so this is obviously the bottom because that's got a cutout for the jumper and for the trimmer. Put that off to the side. It only goes in one way, it must be that way. All right, let's see if we can figure out how these fellers go. Oh, we've got long ones and short ones. Long, and we've got standoffs, and we've got barrels. Okay, so my guess is we're gonna put the barrel up like that, the barrel, the standoff up like that into the barrel. And then we're gonna take the longer screws, one, two, three, four. And we'll use the longer screws to go through the feet. Well, that's pretty neat. And then next we'll put the sides on. There we go. Looks like we got it done. That's pretty neat. I like that. Pretty slick. If, if connect the antenna to hear the voice, and do not connect the antenna to hear the voice of a great difference, then it's normal. Connect emulo, connect the key, and power on. Now you can use the key to control. Now you can use the key control to send. Static current in the sending state under the virtual load will be fever. Note the sending time cannot be too long. So that's probably uh, so that you don't overheat things. Okay, so I did the dummy load with the banana plug adapter, the binding post adapter, and I've got my power cable here. Let's turn this thing around so it connects. And here we go, first time, first try. Well, the LED came on a little bit. And then went right back off. It blinks on and off, okay. I'm not hearing anything. Let's get a key. Awesome. Okay, so you can see the light blink when I tap the key. And it doesn't seem to know anything other than straight key. Let me turn on my nearby radio here. So we are working on the first try. Okay, so if you folks were wondering what the jumper was, that enables the speaker. So that's pretty annoying. Wow.
Excellent. My uh, my wonderful straight key skills. Let's see if we got picked up on reverse beacon network. And the answer is no. That could be any number of reasons why. I'm not getting enough power out of this thing to register on my power meter and I'm not getting heard anywhere. And that could be A, something wrong with the output. B, my horrible sync straight key CW skills. C, the ridiculously long length of coax that I'm running that's the wrong kind of coax. This is RG316. So there's a, a bunch of line losses there. And then <laughs> the length on that is almost 200 feet to get to the antenna. So lots of different things. I can actually hear this and see it on the waterfall on my 7300. So we'll take a look at that. Looking pretty good to me and still not being heard. <laughs> Excellent. I'm gonna keep playing. This has been fun. And how does it sound on the other end? This is the Super Pixie going out through the DX Commander and coming in through no antenna on the IC7300. Okay, so what does that big knob do on the top of this thing? I'm gonna key down and turn the knob. All right, so turning it all the way up, you hear that background noise? That's actually the radio transmitting. It's actually, I just noticed this, off frequency. Switch this over to break-in mode, and let's go back over to the Pixie and see what the Pixie sounds like. All right, so now we are all reset for listening, and what I found was, it's, uh, if I put it in all the way, it's silent. And I thought the radio was dead, so I backed it out of here, a hair, and I heard noise. So there we go. I am transmitting from my 7300 through the DX Commander into this radio here and out of this speaker for you. <laughs> you can hear the fan in the 7300 spin up when I transmit. I mean, I can hear it. I don't know if it's coming through the, the video camera microphone here. So let's try and do something here. And I'm still not being heard on the reverse beacon network. So I'd say there's something going on with the bands today. Now this knob also affects your receive. Again, when we did the transmit test earlier, when you turn it up all the way, you can hear it transmitting something. So if I... So I can hear myself locally, but I can't hear myself out in the world. And I am putting some power out because I'm receiving it on the other radio. So all signs point to success and then uh, band conditions are your, are your friend. It looks like this internal speaker only works on transmit. That was pretty cool. $15 for the kit. There is a link in the description down below. I just, I just still don't have a BNC connector. It's like Legos around here. There's a link in the description down below for the kit. It is definitely worth $15 of enjoyment. Why couldn't I be heard on the bands? 
Ban conditions, they're a thing, who knew? I wasn't hurt at 100 watts, so I'm sure I'm not gonna be hurt at whatever half a watt this thing is putting out. However, I was able to hear myself in the vicinity, so it is working, and I was able to receive my signals in the vicinity. So send and receive are both working. It mentioned something about an automatic key or an manual key, but I didn't expect anything because there's no chips on here to do the automatic keying, the iambic keying that people are in love with, like myself. So you got to listen to some of my straight key work. Sorry. I'm not a straight keyer, but uh, that kind of straight key is what happens when you just get it and do it instead of stressing out about it. So it's still fun for me to do a little bit of straight key here and there, but that was probably the fifth time I've straight keyed in my life. There's a video right over here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome with a palm size radio. We'll see you in the next one.